this is a special session that we realize we have to feature these two topics because after picking all the speakers we said what's going on with the medium and what is this national biodiversity strategies actually plan so like all the other speakers he just took one phone call and the speaker said yes we'll do it uh, it helped that Linda was one of the organizers so she didn't have a choice uh, but now we are awaiting uh, Tan Sui He, Dr. Tan, and he came to NUS many years ago. Um, he had this eager looking face, and he was accompanied by his sidekick, Kyok Hui, and they like to collect fish. So they, they always came together, and they like fish, and he also likes crabs. And during those days in the lab, you would hear a lot of complaints about what the museum wasn't. It was a zoological reference collection. It could be something better. Uh, we all were interested in museums. So after complaining for a really long time and hearing all the complaints and how you know we could obviously do a better job, uh, now he's in charge. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Uh, here, please. Thank you very much. Oh, Siva is only probably the only person in the whole theatre that knows my dirt. <laughs> Way back when I first entered NUS in 1992. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I think lunch is quite meagre because it's actually the uh, university's uh, recess week. So the canteen operators are telling me how come there's a whole bunch of people coming for lunch at 1 o'clock. I said, such is life. I mean, like many things in my life. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm an RC, retired carcinologist, because I used to study crab with my director, uh, Professor Peter Ng. Okay, but then after that, I joined the museum after I graduated, and I became a curator of crustaceans. And I usually introduce myself as curator of dead seafood. Because I, all the dead crab, all the dead lobsters, dead prawns are all under my charge. Of course, the ir irony of the whole situation is I'm allergic to all this seafood. <laughs> this is called karma, you know, if you believe in it. So along the way, you know, things develop. And as you say, you know, what we used to complain what the museum wasn't. Well, the museum still isn't. But hopefully in the future, it will look something like this. Okay, so today I will try to uh, give you a... That's fast? <laughs> I think Zihan has heard this talk many times. <laughs> okay, today I will just attempt to give you an update on the, the, the development of the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. As some of you who have been following the development of the museum, we have uh, managed to successfully uh, fundraise to build to build or resurrect Singapore's Natural History Museum. I recognize a lot of new faces here. Perhaps it'll be, uh, I would like to go through, uh, introduce a little bit about what uh, the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity is. So we were the National Museum right, established in 1874 at Stamford Road. Uh, then after that, uh, we became National Museum when Singapore gained independence. But after that, due to several political uh, situations, um, it decided that you know National Museum should focus more on the history and development of Singapore, and therefore uh, natural history might take a back seat. And that sort of started our nomadic lifestyle for the next few, for a decade or so, uh, because we were literally homeless until the University of Singapore decided to take in the collection. You now, if you are going to throw the collection away, you might as well keep it in the university uh, and use it as a teaching collection for the undergraduate students. When, in, when University of Singapore merged with Nanyang University uh, and formed the campus on uh, Clementi at the, at the National University of Singapore, the university administration very kindly gave us three levels at Block S6 to store the, this uh, Singapore's natural history collection. And that was the end, for that moment, the end of a nomadic lifestyle. 
Okay, everything seems good. Okay, the collection has been protected, and that's where we are been today. In 1998, uh, 1998, uh, university requested that we relook at our development and uh, strategies to see whether we can uh, build on this collection and whether can we do something better. So our core focus at the moment is now, of course, to protect Singapore's natural history collection, to build on our research. Uh, of course, education is always one of our core functions, being in the university. And perhaps can we uh, develop a little bit of a services uh, to uh, Singaporeans in general. So as a part of this um, idea of reorganizing Raffles Museum of Biodiversity Research, we did conduct a visit to several, uh, six museums in the United States to actually study uh, various models. Okay, what happened to that study is we came up with a white paper, but it remained as, as that. Though. Okay, just a white paper. Okay, but at the back of our minds, we are always thinking about, hmm, will one day our collection regain its former glory as Singapore's Natural History Museum? And what are we talking about? Okay, we are talking about half a million uh, spe uh, unique specimens in the collection, uh, broken down into uh, these various groups. Okay, and we do hold some rather significant collections, including 50 birds and mammal species that are uh, extinct from Singapore. Uh, but we might have to deduct a few numbers all because we now know the porcupine is still around. So the, I need to update this slide. <laughs> and everything came to a head in, in 2009 when we held our International Museum Day open house. On that day, it was estimated that the gallery hosted, our small tiny gallery of only 200 square meters, hosted almost 3,000 visitors. At one point, I was ready to call in Office of Campus Security because we were afraid that the gallery could not support all the weight in the gallery. And that started a flurry of uh, letters in the uh, uh, mainstream media about whether it's time that we have a real natural history museum uh, in Singapore. And the big surprise is not this turtle that landed on my office, but I received a call from a representative of an anonymous donor who pledged $10 million to us to kickstart the Natural History Museum uh, rebuilding uh, exercise. And that got us very excited, and it was quite an exhilarating uh, journey. But, it, but our challenge was, is given by the university, that we have to raise $35 million within six months, or else the university will not give us the land uh, for the museum. And with goodwill from the public, and several of our major uh, supporters, we managed to raise 46 million in six months in order to build Singapore's Natural History Museum. So everybody asked, ah, oh, the new museum is going to come out. Where is it? Okay. So this is one, the, one corner of uh, the N NUS Clementi campus. This is the University Cultural Center. And besides it is uh, the NUS Museum. Behind that is a Yong Siu Conservatory of Music. And to the right-hand side, in a rather indiscreet uh, building, is the uh, Office of Estate uh, Development. And this is where the new museum will come out in 2014. <laughs> this is a rough uh, project schedule. Okay? So the phase one, we are right in the middle of it. Uh, we have appointed our architectural consultant, W Architects, the Architects is one of the few architecture, local architectural firms that have some experience in building and renovating uh, museums. The extension annex at National Museum was done by them, and they are currently renovating Victoria Concert Hall and Victoria Theatre. Uh, our consultants for the Natural History Museum in UK uh, conducted a workshop and is in charge of our master plan, which we have concluded on the 1st of September. And now we are deep into design, the design phase for the new museum. Come July next year, we will try to demolish OED by hook or by crook. And then the construction of the museum hopefully will begin. And 
towards the end of 2013, we will try to furnish the public gallery uh, of the museum. And we hope to have sort of soft launch uh, in the beginning of 2014 and hopefully officially open by the middle of 2014. This is the artist's impression of the new museum. Uh, this is the Yong Siu To Conservatory of Music and this is the museum itself. The artist's uh, concept is that of a, like a rock uh, with a green wall in front. Okay. This is uh, another view by the architect. So when, when I first looked at it, I was like, wow, avatar. <laughs> <laughs> then I got very nervous because I'm not quite sure how you're going to do this, but consultations with Rhea seems to suggest that we might find enough uh, native vegetation. <laughs> Real, you are involved in everything. You know. <laughs> so we, we might have a chance to recreate uh, something similar to this. Okay, we will try our best. We will consult all our botanists. And this is a cross section of the museum. Okay, so it's a six story building. The gallery occupies the lower first story and the upper first story. Uh, sorry, this is supposed to be a two floors of wet collection. This is a dry collection. Uh, this is the office space. And of course, hmm what will be a major centerpiece for the museum. And you know, this is the artist's impression. But if you have read the newspapers, we have something bigger in mind. The fate of three sauropod dinosaurs. <laughs> Do I have extra time? I can stop now. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief. So the original thought of the major exhibit was that of the whale that we used to have at National Museum. But the government has given it away to Malaysia, so we can't really get it back. Short, short of hoping something dies on our shore, lah, then we'll, we'll talk to NEA. Ah. I also realized that I'm the proponent of dead animals, where everybody here prefers to see theirs alive. So I'm definitely a minority here. So somebody said, oh wow, well, we happen to have three dinosaurs. Will you be interested in looking at it? So I look at it. Wow, so expensive. Ah. How are we going to, we just finished one fundraising uh, exercise. How on earth are you going to raise another big amount of money for this, this tree? So we threw the question at our scientific advisory board. I said, do you think dinosaurs would be a good idea for the Natural History Museum? Then they came back and said, yes, it's a very good idea. So, okay, the fundraising starts again. So what are, the, what are these three dinosaurs? One is Apollo, quite a majestic uh, sauropod that they think belong into the family Diplodocidae. Uh, it's about 24 meters in length, uh, discovered in 2007. This is similar to the specimen you see in the, British, uh, in the Natural History Museum in London. The second is a cute juvenile called Twinkie that has been discovered in 2009 and was mounted uh, about one month ago. This man is here for size and you can see a juvenile is actually quite an uh, impressive specimen as it is. What's even more impressive is uh, earlier, a couple of years, three years back, they discovered another specimen, okay, uh, estimated to be about 27 meters in length, which they call Prince. And this is uh, we sent a team in June to actually have a look at the dinosaurs itself. You know, when people sell you dinosaurs, you better check. Lah. Who knows, they may be making the dinosaurs somewhere in some North Asian countries. <laughs> <laughs> so, we were there, we participated in the dinosaur day, and we are very convinced it's real. Okay? <laughs> but after a while, uh, just this prince was so huge and the neck vertebrae was so large, so massive, that they started to think that the original specimen they, they call Apollo may be female instead. So therefore, Apollo has changed its name to Apollonia. <laughs> well, you know. But it was an immensely difficult journey. Okay, the goodwill was given to us because everybody felt that to build a natural history museum for Singapore was a worthy cause. But uh, there were a lot more debate when we are talking about uh, purchase of three dinosaurs. The most common complaint is, what has dinosaurs got to do with Singapore? Singapore got dinosaurs, meh. Ah, this is <laughs> always the same question. But we felt dinosaurs have immense educational value. 
and it's definitely something worth looking at. Okay, so fortunately, after three weeks, uh, our anonymous donor and a few of uh, major donors have come together, and we can manage to uh, push ahead with the purchase. And here is Apollonia looking forward to her visit to Singapore, or oh, permanent residency in Singapore. But the fundraising continues because one type of dinosaur is not a, a, it's not an exhibition make. Okay, we hope that we can complement the dinosaur display with other uh, to narrate a storyline about life on Earth since uh, the beginning. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Suhi. Now we know what was, has been going on. Oh, well, at least half of it. And, and the next speaker for the special session is uh, Linda Go. Linda Go was from this university a long time ago. We actually organized the Super Senior Seminar in 90... What? Uh? I can't remember. Okay, we all can't remember suddenly. <laughs> okay. Linda Go is in charge of Singapore's National... By the Sea Strategy and Action Plan, and take away Linda. Thank you, Siva. So when Siva suggested that we have special updates, the well-known topic on the dinosaur came, and then we decided that for MPAC, we will talk about the little-known topic, the Singapore National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, NEPSET for short. So unless you have gone to MPAC's website, went into Biodiversity tab, gone into that, and then searched for NEPSET, you probably not heard of NEPSET, or much of it. So this was a fantastic platform actually because the biodiversity conservation community are all here, 300 of you, and you helped me to spread the word you know, based on your circle of influence to the people about NEPSAP. And whether you are aware or not, what you're doing are contributing to the National Strategy and Action Plan, what, you're, what you've been doing, the activities that you're doing. And this is a national um, master plan for biodiversity and it would help to truly make our city a garden city, okay, where it's surrounded and embraced by a diversity of flora and fauna. So this master plan is not done up just by NPARC, okay. Um, we have inputs from the various agencies as well as nature groups. And it is um, our international regional commitment to CBD, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which we are signatory to. Okay. So just uh, to go through some of these principles that guide in the implementation. So basically what we are looking at is that our natural heritage should be conserved for future generations. There should be considerations on biodiversity and ecosystem in our national planning process and that we adopt a balanced view. We have a total of five strategies, so I'm just going to run through the strategies with you and some of the activities that you guys are actually contributing to. All right? The first one is actually safeguard our biodiversity. What we are looking at is actually concerted effort to protect the existing and to look at whether or not to bring back what we have lost. All right? And one of the things we are looking at in terms of action is con uh, species conservation and recovery program. The Hornbill project is an example where we put nest boxes and we have brought the Hornbill into Changi area, Loyang area and even Botanic Gardens, you can see them now. And we also have a project with NUS and part of the project with NUS to look at the banded leaf monkey. Um, Andy and Mirza are looking at this, this project. We are looking at rehabilitating areas that have been previously degraded. The Tekong project is, is one example. The poster is out there so you can actually read about it. We are looking at extending green corridors to counter fragmentation. Ecoling, Delphin has talked about it. And also utilize parks for ex situ conservation. And we, MPARC has set up a uh, Ishun Ditorokap Arboretum as part of the conservation of these rare trees. Okay. So these are just some examples. Even PUB, the ABC Waters Program, is another example of how we go about safeguarding our biodiversity. The other Strategy two is actually to consider biodiversity issues in policy and decision making. The integrated coastal management is another example. And my colleagues from the coastal and marine team actually set up 
posters outside which you can read about because basically our coastal marine areas are made use of by many different sectors and we need to come together with the integrated approach to ensure that we, our natural resources are being conserved properly. The other example that we looked at is also Che Jawa. You know, the government actually studied the appeal from the ground with the support from uh, experts in terms of documentation of the unique biodiversity they, and also looking into uh, the land use and they decided that this place can be conserved for as long as possible. So today we have actually our Chek Jawa. Strategy 3 looks at improved knowledge of our biodiversity and the natural environment. Actually all the posters out there help to contribute to this strategy. And um, we actually encourage and facilitate research. So we work closely with also Tropical Marine Science Institute. We collaborate with them and we actually supported a project to look at sponges in Singapore. So Sui Cheng is actually looking at that. His poster is also out there. You can actually read about it. Um, we also look at maintaining a list of the conservation status of the plants and animals in Singapore. And that's where we have the read data book done by NPARC, NUS, as well as uh, NSS. Strategy 4 looks at enhanced education and public awareness. Basically, we want to increase awareness, appreciation of our biodiversity, and we're doing it through roadshows, public seminars like this. And what Karen has mentioned fits in very nicely into this strategy. We also look at promoting volunteerism, which our guest owner has spoken about today, the community in nature, trying to get people, community, be more involved in, um, in the environment. And we're also looking at incorporating biodiversity uh, conservation in the curriculum. This morning we have a very lively discussion on that and these are still things that we still need to do and work on. And one of the things that we can actually um, look at in terms of enhancing awareness, I've been told to do this advertisement, we actually <laughs> we're actually having this city in a garden photo competition where all of you can participate to take pictures of trees and forests biodiversity and our city in the garden and these pictures were actually roved around Singapore to raise awareness of what we have because we have done this co uh, competition last year and we realized that not many people actually know we have such fantastic biodiversity so this is an opportunity for everyone to take part and to raise awareness and finally strategy 5 is on strengthening partnership with stakeholders and promote international collaboration we have the comprehensive marine biodiversity survey where we are working with 300 volunteers um, Shell company has come in to support us with funding, Care for Nature, Trust Fund as well. And Jonathan will be talking more about it later on so you can find out more about this project. And we have Team Seagrass. And not just at the national level, but we're also looking at international level. Wendy, my colleague here, is actually heading a team to look at the Singapore Index and to establish um, an index to monitor biodiversity conservation in cities. So these are some of the things that we're trying to promote and do. So these are the five strategies that we have um, under NAPSAP. And what we want to do is actually go out and call for participation. We want a multi-stakeholder um, group to come in to help us to actually track the implementation of NAPSAP. Because a lot of people are doing many things, but we need to capture this so that we know what's the progress we are, we are making. And we are calling for people who are contributing to NEPSET, the activities that you do are contributing to NEPSET, to come in to help us. And we'll also be going out to form a focus group to look at the national targets so that we can track what we have done. And um, for those of you who are interested, you can contact me at this email address. All right. And if you want to read more about the strategy, the NEPSET is actually available online at NPARC's website. Thank you. Okay, I just I just want to point out that it's quite tough navigating the MPARC's web page. So we'll put it on the symposium we'll download the document and we'll put it on the symposium web page. Um, so that you can get a hold of it. And do email Linda, we'll put her email address as well.
Okay. Now, uh, are there any questions on the floor for either Linda or Suhi? Alright, excellent. So, marine session, the marine chairs can take over. Fresh water, sorry, I, <laughs> I stared at two fresh water people and said marine. <laughs> they are like the botanists of the Bida Sea World. I'm sorry, come and reclaim your position. Okay, hi everyone. Is everyone having fun? We're not dead yet. Good. Okay. Um, my name is Maxine and this is Adam and we're going to chair the freshwater session. Um, basically, I'm not going to go into it again. Darren has already talked about it. But um, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I study toxic cyanobacteria in our reservoirs. And right now I'm working on a project with one of our speakers, Yet Tin, and um, she'll tell you more about what we study. But um, yeah, I'll let Adam tell you what he does. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm from uh, Topical Marine Science Institute. We have a new lab that just set up quite recently on freshwater ecology. Uh, we've been working in quite closely with UV as well as uh, MPARCS. And in fact, I should jump directly to our first speaker, right, Ben Lo. I will, I've been working with him quite closely for the last two months right, on ecological standards that they have been uh, researching on as well as the uh, POM project. Now, his talk is probably going to be on uh, ABC project on waterways as well as uh, ponds. Right? Take it away, Ben. Thanks for the introduction. Just now I was just talking to somebody uh, uh, this morning that I feel a bit, little bit out of place today because I'm not actually from biological science background and I'm asked to uh, give a presentation today. So uh, please bear with me. And I have notes right in front of me which I need to refer to. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Basically there are three projects I'd like to cover but I think I'll drop the third one for time being. The first project is actually uh, development of the water quality guidelines. Uh, for fresh water ponds in Singapore. And the second project is actually the redevelopment of Kalang River, that I believe I think most of you are actually aware of, and the cleansing bio uh, which is one of the um, uh, POB ABC uh, water features. And this bio uh, is, is actually one of the features that uh, been, uh, just, just completed. Uh, it's a feature that used to clean up the pond, existing pond in Vision Park. Water quality standards do exist in Singapore for uh, management of drinking water reservoirs by PUB and uh, recreational uh, waters uh, with respect to human health by NDA. However, no form of um, ecological standards are applied by any of the agencies. So there's an absence of integrated assessment of both uh, chemical parameters and ecological status due to the absence uh, of a holistic framework and because of this, it is actually uh, quite difficult or almost impossible for NPARCs to uh, manage our own freshwater ponds or wetlands as in the one uh, at Sinkang in an ecologically appropriate manner. And currently, we have just uh, completed uh, this uh, uh, baseline study uh, and we found out that uh, actually there are f uh, 46 ponds managed by NPARCs across the island as many as 22 ponds were designed and constructed primarily for aesthetic reasons. And the other 24 ponds in the parks are mainly for recreational value, irrigation, sedimentation, and some for biodiversity reasons. So because most of the ponds, uh, they are important visual elements to landscape or parks. Therefore, it makes sense that the current water quality um, uh, water quality monitoring a model is driven uh, by aesthetic value. For instance, um, they will only take the water samples when they see the water turn green. And that's uh, when uh, algae bloom actually reach a threshold level or decline in the water transparency. Um, that affects the visual quality of the ponds. So what we are trying to do here now is actually trying to develop a second model uh, that focuses on the ecological value and see if it is actually possible to um, balance between the two. 
So the objective of this project is to assess the current uh, ecological and the water quality status of uh, those ponds that are managed by MPARCs. Most of them are actually shallow ponds compared to reservoirs or uh, lakes. And to determine the natural reference uh, conditions and to define the eco um, ecosystem restoration goals. So far, working together uh, with uh, SDWA, Singapore Delta Water Alliance, and uh, uh, TMSI, we have already reviewed the existing water quality measurements collected from ponds uh, managed by MPARCs. And in fact, the coming uh, Wednesday, we are going to conduct a workshop to provide a broad understanding of the current ecological status of those ponds that we have studied. And, and going to invite a lot of our expert people like you all to come uh, uh, to give us some advice on how to uh, develop these ecological standards. So now I'm going to move to the second project, uh, redevelopment of the Kalang River and uh, Bishan Park. This project came about when it was recognized that the Bishan Park and its recreational facilities are not integrated along Kalang Canal. And secondly, the water in the existing pond was highly eutrophic with highest chlorophyll A concentration of 200 ppb recorded early last year. So working together with PUB and parks and other private uh, parties, the project aims to uh, transform this uh, concrete hard, uh, hard ages canal into the natural river and also to uh, improve the water quality uh, of the existing uh, ponds in the park through uh, this passive system or uh, uh, this um, um, uh, cleansing biotope. This is just to show you the location uh, of the parks. I think most of you are quite familiar. It's dissected by Amokyo Avenue 6. And this is an early photo of the pre-development stage of the park. Okay, and there was the, this uh, three kilometer long canal that runs along the park. So, working together uh, with PUB, this uh, canal uh, is now being transformed into a meandering river. And this photo was taken just a few months ago. The park now is uh, becoming a home for diverse uh, wildlife. Under a recent biodiversity survey by NPARCs and NBC, four species of Dempsey flies and 15 species of dragonflies were found. And this diagram basically just shows you the gradient uh, of the abundance of species of dragonflies found in the park. Not only dragonflies and Dempsey flies are witnessed in the park, 31 species of birds are also identified. About 10 species constantly interact with the river. An interesting fact was noted that there is more water birds come uh, to the park now than before the canal was naturalized. And there's a good diverse, uh, diversity of birds was seen among wild grasses and planted islands away from the slope bank of the river. Now, this photo uh, uh, that you see here is actually, uh, there was a condition of the water in the existing pond. And it's highly eutrophic and you can see it's uh, full of uh, uh, algae and, and scums. So the idea was actually using, uh, introducing these uh, ABC uh, features. They call this is a, a cleansing biotope, which works quite similar to subsurface uh, uh, constructed wetlands, whereby the water is going to pump up from the existing pond through these uh, three layers of filter media. So the plant is going to be in. So the plant uh, provide the environment that is going to uh, uptake the nutrients out from the pond. And this is just to uh, 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 show you the grain size of the field media. This is the top layer of the uh, biotope cleansing. And now that's been completed, existing pond uh, has a, this existing pond has a volume of approximately 18,000 cubic meters. So with a pump in the pond that circulates water at a rate of 100 liters per second, the pond water will be completely exchanged within a period of two days which is faster than the generic reproduction of period of typical algae species. And this is the last photo I'd like to show. Uh, it's the final planting that's just been completed, I think about a month ago. 
So I have time for the third project. Okay, <laughs> the third one is uh, is actually uh, um, it's a uh, uh, to show you uh, the effectiveness of this uh, um, bio retention system in cleaning up this existing pond at the Emirati Park. Um, we have this pond just next to Sakura uh, Restaurant. It was designed uh, as a serve as a sedimentation basin to treat the stormwater runoff within the seven hectares of parkland. But currently, as you look at the photos, um, sorry, uh, so, so this is the uh, pond I was just talking about. It's currently the water has ba is badly polluted or contaminated by iron oxide that actually leach out from the, uh, uh, the soil and within the uh, park's catchment itself. And this is uh, another photo. It was taken just uh, a few months ago and you can see uh, the oil light sheen on top of that. And this is the water that come up from the concealed drain. So I, I collected the water samples uh, from the inlets just now, I'll just show you. And you can see from the first column uh, that the total iron is quite high, 37.7. So the idea of this project is actually using ABC uh, water features to uh, clean up uh, the discharge that direct into uh, the pond. So you have to treat it first before they are being discharged into the receiving water body. So the idea is to intercept the water first. And we're going to have a, a hybrid of a sand filter and bioretention system. So the water will come in will be uh, treated first by a sand filter and then discharged into a bioretention system and back to the pond, likewise for the other catchment area. And this is just to show you the cross-section of the typical bioretention system. Uh, we have tested using a prototype like this and I tested, collected the samples from the existing ponds and you can see the, um, the, influence, uh, that, uh, the, in the influence going into the pond the concentration is high and the effluent treated is almost non-detectable. And what surprised me is that uh, those, uh, after the plant that uh, has been planted in, after um, a few months of, uh, uh, of the planting, not only uh, the system uh, didn't clog, but the hydraulic conductivity increased. You can see from the uh, schedule. Uh, the first uh, biofilter, uh, increased from 7.8 to 27.78 millimeter, uh, millimeter per hour, and likewise for the rest. That's all I'd like to share. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, the next speaker that I want to introduce is Yet Tin. So she's been working with PUB for the past five years, and she's a manager. And basically, she studies what I study, plankton. <laughs> So she's going to tell you a little bit about the book that um, has just come out, A Guide to Freshwater Plankton, and hopefully it's the start of many more guides to come. Plankton is just as important as other things. <laughs> Yet Tin. Hi, thanks Maxine and Adam. Um, I'm Yet Tin, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here to share on behalf of the, my colleagues on the small things that matter, the phytoplankton, and our our guidebook, this um, freshwater phytoplankton in Singapore reservoirs. Um, okay, let me just start. Okay, so this is for the the people who doesn't really have a, a bio background. So if you if you just look at these pictures, you can see algae appearing everywhere. So this is in red snow in soy on the animal's fur like this sloth and also on our polar bears, on, on buildings, roofs and um, trees and also in the marine environment, this gigantic sea kelp which can reach up to 60 meters high. And it also, algae also forms this symbiotic association with corals. So algae can be found everywhere and they are primary producers which form the, the base of the um, food chain or food web. So they are very important. So let me start by giving an introduction to freshwater phytoplankton and followed by the guidebook. So in freshwater, you can see this is um, 
one photo taken in our reservoir. There are three main groups of algae. We term them the periphyton. These are the attached algae. So in order to examine this, you need to scrape off the algae from the, the surface of the rock. Then you can observe them under the microscope. Next, there is this big group, the phytoplankton. These are algae which is floating or suspended in the water column. So it's easy to take a sample. You just uh, collect water from the water body. Now the third group is the benthic algae. This refers to the microscopic and macroscopic algae at the bottom of a water body. So in Singapore, in PUB, we actually look at the phytoplankton. That's the algae that's uh, freely suspended. So um, what can we see? In what, what kind of phytoplankton do we observe? This algae can be single cell. They can be many cells clustered together in regular groups or in irregular cluster arrangement. They can be in a coil, coil structures or in straight chains. And some of them can move around because they, some of them, they actually have um, this flagella. I'm not very sure if you can see the uh, flagella here. Okay. Some algae can actually move by other means as well. So if I take a drop of that water sample and put it under the slides and observe it under the microscope, this is what I, I would see. So there's many different types of algae. It's very diverse. They come in different colors, in different forms. And it's actually a rojak. It's a mixture of different algae, algal groups. So all these algal groups, they are, they are divided based on their photosynthetic pigments, their main pigments found, and um, based on their um, storage products as well. So I'll just now I'll just go into the main algal groups now. There are about eleven main groups depending on which classification system you look at. And um, out of these eleven main groups, there are about eight which are freshwater types because some of them are actually more marine based, like the red algae. So we have tried to cover this main groups. Now for the cyanobacteria which is also termed the blue-green algae that uh, Maxine talked about and she's working on. So the cyanobacteria, they do not have nuclear cell walls. They are actually prokaryotes. And you can see they have this kind of um, blue-green tinge. So these are some which can be found in our reservoirs. And they can cause um, maybe some problems. Um, they are known to produce toxins, but fortunately, in Singapore's context, we have not actually found high levels of uh, toxin. But who knows, right? Okay, maybe um, Maxine will further look into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then there's the other big group, that's the green algae. Now you can see they have this uh, grassy green color. And um, again, they can be in different shapes, like this is like bean or heart shaped. And then there's the crescent shape. And here's some more green algae. And this particular alga, it actually um, produces some oil droplets. So some scientists, they are looking into this um, because algae could be the next biofuel. So, okay. And we have other big groups like the diatoms. This has uh, the silica cell wall. The euglenoids, which we find them in um, highly organic um, waters, waters with high nutrients, and the dinoflagellates, which are known to cause problems in a marine environment. They are known for red tides. Okay, then there's the yellow-green algae, which may look quite similar to your green algae, but they have a different storage product. And um, there is the golden brown algae, which can look very nice as well. Okay, so I think Ben Lowe, he has seen quite a number of this scum. So have you seen this scum? They may not be green in color. They may be yellow, 
they may be red and some may be even black or looking something like an oil foam. So algae, they, they are a problem to us at PUB because um, they can produce scum, which is surface accumulation of cells. And that happens when the cell density of the algae increases. So there is an imbalance in the um, ecosystem and that will result in coloration or formation of scum, which is not actually what we want because we want a very nice looking water environment or water body. Okay, so this particular yellow scum is actually due to this microcystis. It seems to be a decomposed um, microcystis population. And this green scum here is actually due to this algae, which is the spirogyra. That's the green algae. Um, the one on the right side, that's the blue-green algae, um, planktotrix. So it forms a very thin layer of phloem. And this bottom one, the red uh, scum, is caused by this euglena. So euglena are known to be mealy green, but they can actually produce this red pigment. It's supposedly um, to protect them from the high sunlight. So when, when they turn red, the scum also turns red. So it's pretty interesting that um, algae, it's, it causes scum, not just by one single algal group, but different algal groups, and the scum can be of different colors. So now I'll talk about this guidebook. My co-author, Dr. Chum, she's over there on the sixth row, I think. Yeah. So Dr. Chum, maybe you can wait. <laughs> so this Dr. Chum and uh, Ying Mei, she's not here today. Um, this was, she reached another milestone of her life. She climbed the uh, Mount Everest base camp. So that was after completing the book. <laughs> so we... Actually, um, PUB, we started looking at algae quite some time ago, in 1974. And we were the only lab who, who was routinely looking at um, algae or phytoplankton and quantifying them. I think this is a little known fact as well. So the aim was to actually, we had that accumulated that much of information and we wanted to provide readers with a reference to the more common algae found in our reservoirs. So the, the original intention was to share with uh, our staff, um, PUB staff, but we found that it would be useful to share this information with our students or any other persons who are interested in this. So we wanted readers to appreciate the rich diversity and understand the problems that could be brought about by this algae. And finally, appreciate that algae is an essential part of the aquatic ecosystem and also what POB does to ensure clean waters. So we worked with um, Science Centre on this because we, we find that they, they have the mission of um, education and they have a long history of publishing local nature guidebooks. This phytoplankton guidebook is the 45th in the um, series. And they are known to have a good outreach of more than 30,000 readers. So they were very interested and they actually helped to fund 100% of the cost. So um, I'll just quickly end off and uh, this is a quote which I would like to share. Every worthwhile accomplishment has a price tag in terms of hard work, patience, faith and endurance. So we had some ideas for a new project, so zooplankton maybe next. And maybe someone in the crowd has some other ideas. We can work together. So these are some photos we have taken. And um, Science Center also has some good news to share. There will be an upcoming new book to be out by end of this year. It's a guide to snails and other non-marine molars of Singapore. That's by Xiong Tech and Ruben. So just acknowledge um, the people who we have worked with on this book the bio lab from PUB and thank you. Thank you so much, Yuting. All right, from something small that matters, we are moving to yet another small thing. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> Alright, so our next speaker is, uh, happened to be my colleague, uh, Chong Jun Yen. He used to be with PUV as well. He has joined us uh, earlier this year. And his topic is going to be on uh, bugs in the soup. <laughs> Hi, Jun Yen. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jun Hyun. I worked at PUB before, but now I'm here. And I would like to share about what Adam and I do in our lab. But essentially, today we are really talking about relationships. <laughs> um, the relationship of us in our environment. The relationship our biodiversity in our lives and the environment, of course. So, this is the first thing that came to my mind when I was invited to give a talk about what we do in our lab, which I'll tell you shortly. Um, and I've been very privileged to share this uh, on behalf of my lab, which Adam and I work in, uh, under the direction of Dr. X Esther Clues. So without further ado, let us take a look. Why bugs in my soup can be so alarming to some of us. It was an object of irritation, object of annoyance, object of frustration for some of us living both in the east and both in the west. For those of you who live in these areas, you will know and I will not say further. It was such a terrible situation that uh, complaints were coming in when I was working at PUB about soup filled with black little insects, about insects that come in swarms and cover the floodlights in the corridors. This, this complaints plague the department where I work in. And we wanted to try our best to solve it, of course. But some things in nature need time and need patience and need understanding. And therefore, what was the object of frustration turned into an object of interest, an object of obsession for some of us in our lab. These things are actually called non-biting mejas and they are chironomids. They are harmless. They don't bite because they don't have the, the biting proboscis like the mosquitoes. They look very similar to the mosquitoes, but they don't spread diseases. They can cause an allergic response and other shock and scary responses from little kids who find them in their soup. But of course, they come under a group we call macroinvertebrates. But I want to start off by sharing with everyone what macroinvertebrates are. They are not as small as plankton, but they are very small. Macro meaning they are small, but still visible to our, to our, to our eyes without magnification. And they are invertebrates because they lack a backbone or the debris like us or other mammals. And here are some examples of what they can look like. And then I will go on to share with you, they are small, they may be small, and there's a lot of them in our environment. I mean, this theme has been recurring in many other presentations today about whether they are here in Singapore or not. And I can assure you they are here, and there are a lot of them. I mean, chironomids, of course, in a few places. But there are many, many different types, and they come in diverse groups. And what we're doing now, we, we're working with up to seven groups uh, from the insect group. Um, they are dragonflies, stoneflies, mayflies, um, caddisflies, um, trueflies, butterflies, beetles. But where do we work with them and where do we find them? Mostly we work with them, in fact, all the time we work with them in aquatic environment. And why? Why, may I ask, do we work with them in the aquatic environment? Because they share 
a relationship with the environment around them and they can tell us some very, very important thing, things sorry, about the environment that, that we should really think about. So I may, I, if I may, let me just start with a non-biological but a bit medical picture in front of you. And I may want to ask everyone here, how are you today? In terms of your health, how are you feeling? Some of you will know exactly how you feel because you can run 2.4 kilometers under 7 seconds. Uh, okay. Some of you know how well you feel because you go for a medical checkup, you take your heart rate, you offer your blood generously to the doctor or the nurses, and they run tests. They run various tests. They run various tests to tell you how fit, how healthy you are. Um, similarly, we can do this with the surroundings, with the, with the environment around us. So let me just ask you, when you look at this picture, can you just tell me, is this environment clean? Is it healthy? Sometimes it is quite intuitive because I heard a small no somewhere. <laughs> the picture can tell you that this place is not healthy. It's polluted with heavy organic content. What about this place? Do you think it's polluted? Do you think it's unhealthy? It's a little bit more difficult to tell now, isn't it? It's a bit subtle. Just like um, if I present to you three glasses of water, all crystal clear, do you know which one of them would be safe to drink? Obviously, they all look like drinking water, and you might even dare to try, but if there is a cup in between the three of them, that might be a glass of clear acid. We will never know until we run certain tests. So, like the same way we run tests to tell ourselves how well we are, we run tests on the environment or we look out for things in the environment. In the past, our ancestors were close to the nature. They were in touch because they depend directly to the environment. We, we hunt, we grow things, we look out for the seasons, we look out for changes. And they do this not just by one day, they do, they do it throughout the years, they look at things change. Similarly, we hope to do the same thing by monitoring, by looking at our environment, looking at how it changed. And therefore, this term has been coined by scientists. We do biological monitoring. We monitor the various biological aspects in the environment so that we know how healthy is the environment that we live in. And I want to add in this now. Uh, it's not in my slides. And because this question has come up consistently throughout the, the symposium, I want to ask, why is biodiversity so important to us? And I want to ask furthermore, with the focus in Singapore, which is highly urbanized, why is biodiversity important to us? For you and me, we know. We know that we love nature for what nature is. We know because the ecological services that it provides us but what about the rest of Singapore who is not here today? Should we share with them that um, there have been many studies that are done in countries all over the world that has shown nature, green spaces and biodiversity improves human living, human well-being, improves our mental health, reduces violence, reduces aggression, increases social adhesion. And I think this could be a chance or opportunity for us to influence policy, influence decision maker, and tell them that biodiversity is more than just a nice, iconic, cute species, but it's, it's primarily, primary key, very vital to our survival, to our well-being, to the quality of life everywhere on Earth. So let me get back to my main issue, which is using what we are obsessed about, oh, that was fast. What, what we are obsessed about to monitor the aquatic environment. So as you can see right here, the various things that I have talked about, they have different tolerance. They occupy various sensitive uh, 
tolerance range to pollution. Therefore, we can use them to establish different weights and then to help us tell ourselves more about the environment, about the aquatic systems. What are the reasons why we decide to use macroinvertebrates? One, they don't move very far, so it helps us to tell the conditions of the localized areas. Very useful, especially when conducting streams uh, surveys. And keys are available, so we can identify the various families quite easily. Secondly, sampling is relatively easy, but I must add, this has an uh, outreach and education um, connotation, which I'll then carry on very quickly. Um, it's also very easy to get kids excited, to get them in the water, catch bugs, and then tell them why these bugs are important to us. So then, why this is important to Singapore and the various agencies is because by knowing the bugs and how they tell us about the environment, it can give us an overall picture of the condition of the streams or the waterways or the water bodies in Singapore, which then sets the tones for various more expensive chemical and physical testing. Secondly, once we have that tool, uh, the tool now is currently being tested by Adam and I and our team. But once this is confirmed, we could use it to identify various places uh, where pollution is, is there, and we can complement it with the physical and chemical analysis. And then, if we implement ABC or restoration projects, we then can use it as a tool to, to judge, to gauge its success. Last of all, with all the data that we collect, if we do it for a long time, we can use it to to come up with models to predict what will happen if we do that, what will happen if we demolish streams, build things. So, last of all, then we can use this and put it together in an integrated catchment management, meaning that PUV or the government doesn't just look at the water, they look at the land around it, they look at the use of the land and what different things are going around. So, oh, okay, so that's, that's all I have. Um, <laughs> I thank you for your attention and let us all think about our relationship with the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Okay, so now we have our last speaker for the freshwater session. Uh, he needs no introduction, but I shall try. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Tan Kyok Hui, he's part of RMBR and also NUS. So he's one of the really lucky ones. He managed to turn his hobby of catching fish and naming fish uh, into a full-time job. So that's great. He gets paid to do what he likes to do. And he has a lot of nicknames. So his, one of his nicknames is Indiana Jones. Yeah? Yeah? And then another nickname is no. Hunter and Gatherer. Yes, that's another one. Fisherman. Fisherman. Sorry, Fisherman. And I witnessed um, his antics in the wild for the first time in Tioman. And yes, I believe all the stories. Okay, Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, just a bit of uh, background information. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about alien or non-native aquatic biota in Singapore currently. Okay, but it's going to include a bit of coastal elements, although it's a freshwater session, because we know there are elements out there that don't actually belong here. Okay. Now, for instance, the cover photograph. This was photographed in one of the West Coast Park, the Marsh Pond. These are really obvious. Pink tilapia. Okay, they stand out like a sore thumb. Are they natural? Don't think so. Okay, just a brief introduction of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I tend to fish in places which are not supposed to fish, but this was in Kenridge Park with permission from Man Parks. Okay. Um, we, did, we did a brief survey for them, basically. So basically, I was educated here. Okay? I've been here in, as a lecturer since 2005. Okay? Uh, I'm, most of my work has been on uh, wild fish taxonomy or systematics. And it has mainly been covering regional stuff rather than local stuff. Because in Singapore, there's very limited scope for wild, fish, uh, wild species taxonomy. Okay, but of late, um, Locally, we've been covering mainly conservation work, okay, um, various collaborative uh, aspects. So currently, that stands, and 
That little fish up there, that's still the world's smallest for the time being. Okay, now, systematically, we know more and more what's happening. But ecologically, we don't. Okay, especially so in tropical Asia, where there's roughly estimated about, three, in Southeast Asia, about 3,000 species of freshwater fish. Okay. And Southeast Asia, uh, I'm sure you're not, uh, not alien to this, consists of uh, several of these countries. And the latest member, I think, is Timor-Leste, but that's a bit far off. Not to forget, okay, we are right smack in the middle of biodiversity hotspot. Okay, not just for freshwater, for marine as well. Okay. Now, a little background info as well about native freshwater fish in Singapore. Okay, these are some timelines that I managed to dig out. Okay, the references at the, at the, at the bottom. So in six, 1966, Alfred was the first person who did up a comprehensive study of freshwater fish of Singapore. He listed 42 species and 31 extinct species. Okay? And in 1990, a much needed update was needed. And 40 species and 26 introduced species was documented by Lim and Ng. In 97, Ng and Lim and I think this is in the... Oh no, okay. In 97, this is in the publication, they listed 59 species and about 23 and extinct species. Okay? And Baker and Lim in 2008 listed this the most current information we have. Now, before I go in further in about alien species, just highlight one native fish species, which is very interesting that Darren brought up earlier. Okay, commonly known stemfish, Harlequin respora. Okay, originally described as a respora heteromorpha, but uh, it was placed under a different genus. Okay, Trigonostigma heteromorpha. Uh, it was described in 1904 by a German uh, scientist from a series of specimens collected from Selangor and Botanic Gardens right here in Singapore. Okay, but sadly, currently, Botanic Gardens don't have the natural system anymore. Hopefully they'll bring it back with a huge system uh, to upgrade the ponds, and we hope to bring it back. Okay. Uh, typically, these species occupy acid water streams and forest streams. Well, it would be an ideal species they have the flagship species of freshwater conservation because this fish typifies freshwater, soft water, and it's one of the denizens in Nisun as well. Okay. This is a series of seven stamps released in 1962, of which one of them is depicted here. Okay. And it's, still, it, it's actually a very well done set of stamps. Um, I counted the skills, it's accurate. Okay, apparently they, they did consult uh, Eric Alfred, then the director of Raffles Museum. Okay. So um, the population is still extant in the central catchment, okay, and very restricted distribution in Singapore and this region as well. Now, the more serious situation, non-natives, tons of it in Singapore. Partly because of release, okay, because Singapore is a major trade hub for ornamental fish, Okay, roughly s more than 700 species are in a tray. Okay, this is from uh, one of the Europe student projects. Uh, in 2010, uh, 54 species were recorded from reservoirs. Now, as you know, reservoirs are not really natural water habitats. Okay, they're artificial. And currently, more than 60 are recorded and counting. Okay, uh, just to run through some of the pictures of the fish, the topmost Bart specimen, that's a tiger perch. Okay. It's found in this region, okay, but not in Singapore, because these are large riverine elements. Even the arowana is not uh, a native to Singapore. Of course, the, other, the three at the bottom are all from uh, South America and America. Okay. The alligator gar, red tailed cat, and the motoro stingray. And of the two most dominant families of non-native fish found so far are cyprinids and cichlids. Okay, here are examples of cyprinids that we get from our reservoirs. And mind you, some of these are big buggers. Okay. Uh, like the carp, uh, we didn't keep that specimen. We caught it, we released it. It was about maybe about 80 cm in length. Okay. These are not small things. But saying that I didn't put in a picture of a tiger bug, that's a small one. Again, it's non-native. And the next slide, it's rather interesting. 
Um, this is a recent photograph of Pandan Canal. It looked like a nice aquarium, actually. <laughs> All the elements there are non-native, okay? Um, South American, Central American, okay? Yes, we can have a cichlid of Singapore. <laughs> we are at a crossroads, okay? Um, in, in Asia, there are very few native cichlids, of which uh, there are three species, but they are all found in India, okay, Southern Asia. So there's a whole mix. Um, okay, the Indian one is, I believe, this one, the green chromite. Okay. All the rest are South American, African. Okay, this is mainly introduced for angling, the Pick up that, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't remember common names very well. <laughs> okay, um, now, then uh, one of my honor students did the work on ecology of introduced fish from southern India and Singapore, and it's been published. A uh, poster is out there as well, you can have a look. This element, uh, this particular species, the green chromite, uh, exists very well in our coastal elements. Okay, brackish water recently has been documented as far south as Sentosa even. Okay, they, they've spread really well. Oh, look on the bright side of things. They are still Asian. <laughs> but just not South Singaporean, you know. Yeah. Well, one way out is to eat them. They are esteemed food fish in, in, in India and okay, in Sri Lanka. And, sorry, and personally I've tried them and they are good. Okay, just a little aspect. I photographed, I photographed in Bintulu, this was in 2005. Okay. Almost none of the species they eat are native. This is Paku from South America, Jalawat from, uh, this is a Thailand species, an Indian Rohui, uh, uh, Labio or sorts, and uh, Tilapia again from Africa. So that's the, the trend nowadays. A lot of non-natives are being used. And what if they get loose? Now, a uh, little foray out, um, silty situation in Singapore, the coastal uh, realm. Interesting photographs and managed uh, uh, images. 66, this was the mid 60s from Alfred's paper. This is 2010. Okay, the profile of Singapore has changed tremendously. All the big rivers are now dammed up, okay, and our coastline looks very straight. Okay, and islands have grown bigger. Okay, uh, vegetation cover has changed quite a bit as well. Okay, that's uh, one of the papers out in Nature in Singapore. This was primeval vegetation cover. It's present. See the natural bits, the, the mangrove cover is just restricted to very, very few bits. And recent photograph, not very good waters because of reclamation, but nonetheless there are still interesting life. Okay, including coral spawnings. But what the main point, there are also non-native marine fish. Okay, these are escapees mainly from aquaculture and from religious releases. Okay, some of these are cultivated like golden pomfret, the leopard grouper, milkfish, uh, mugil cephalus, which is mainly from Hong Kong, uh, star snapper, even the gold bream or a uh, go-eye bream or sea bass, a golden croaker as well. So what's the next step? Okay, more ecological research is needed. Currently, we have student projects mainly working on non-native species. But how do we manage non-native species without knowing what's happening to our native species? So that's the next step. Okay, um, yep, a long list of contributors and assistants. And just not to forget, there are also a lot more. There's one main group that's been not really touched on. That's uh, there are other non-vertebrates as well. Okay, the snails and crustacea, etc. Yep, that's it. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, I want to invite all the four speakers on stage so we can have our question and answer session.
Hi everyone. Um, just one quick comment. We actually have brought down some copies of this book. So the Science Center um, has kindly brought them and they have given a very good discount. It's on half price. So if you want copies of the book, please look for Danny. He's right in the center. Um, okay, he's holding a copy of the book. So you can get it from him. Limited copies. Thank you. Okay, so do we have our first question? Anybody? Anybody? Let's get to Come on, plankton questions, fish <laughs> questions, waterway questions. Oh, we have a comment. Uh, just a broad comment um, on the first presentation by Benjamin and on um, bugs in my soup. Um, these are very nice illustrations of this uh, broader paradigm nowadays, which the Dutch like to call building with nature. Um, it's actually very intuitive, but uh, up until very recently, ignored in Singapore. But agencies are taking notice, and the paradigm is, is this. Uh, in the old days, we think about uh, remediation um, to help nature. Uh, right now, this new concept is to remediate using nature as part of the as one of the tools for remediation. It's it's very elegant, and um, these two. Um, um, presentations actually give very good examples. First of all, uh, instead of in the old days where we would maybe pump the dirty water through some sort of mechanical filtration process, right now we are using plants. And then later on as another step, we are actually using bugs um, to monitor the health of the water, possibly after the first step has been taken. So um, for all the students out there, um, as, as Singapore and in fact the whole world becomes more and more urbanized, people are actually taking notice of this, of this uh, new paradigm and, and they are actually approaching us to, to ask, um, so in what ways uh, if we develop the coastline, for example, touch wood, uh, they don't do it, but if they do, they actually do come to us and ask us, uh, what can we do so that if something happens and we develop the coastline, how can we make sure that nature comes back quicker to resettle? And if you, if you listen to Ria this morning, you do know that these uh, uh, elements of nature uh, actually like to recolonize, but we just have to make sure that the conditions are right. So people are taking notice, uh, both in Singapore and globally. So for all the students out there, uh, growth industry, la, there's money. La, so you might think about <laughs> studying that. Yeah. Any response? Um, no, just, just a, a note as well. Um, when you do use bioremediation, Okay, uh, use plants as natural filters. You must also take note of how to dispose of them. Because these plants, they do take in all the heavy metals and pollutants. And after that, what do you do with the plants? It has to be done responsibly. Yes, uh, this is one of the questions that I, I received last time when there was uh, this uh, uh, professor from UK. He's uh, specialized in uh, constructed weapons. And he also received the same question. That uh, it seems to me that uh, it is not easy to answer. Um, yeah, I mean, likewise, it's all the heavy metal actually locked up in the plants, and even the nutrients uh, that has been uh, uh, locked up in the uh, uh, these plants. From time to time, we do have to harvest them. And the question is, when you harvest them, where are you going to dispose them? You dispose them back in the uh, into the forest. Eventually, the nutrients will leach back out into um, the water. Uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, I think uh, we are now still still in process of studying this. Yeah, it's a good point. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? K can I? Um, sorry. Um, leading to the question, the statement that Jun Hian said just now about um, monitoring, I think as an educator, what we find difficult is that there's so much data out there, but usually they have blocks with opposed to a database, which just now we heard NTAP has a database. And as an educator, we would like to have projects that are done by NUS students that are online, that somehow it's easier for students to access proper scientific data. And with PUV, it is kind of difficult to obtain water monitoring quality data. And even with NEA, we can't get data unless we pay for them. 
So uh, I'm talking about if we want to build a culture of scientific um, monitoring where you want to educate students, data management online with this day and age should be easier for everyone. So I'm wondering whether some, could someone, I'm glad to be involved in it, start this initiation where we have data from PUB, water quality data that we can get access of, um, um, project data from students in the NUS, anywhere, um, higher institution where we can have access to so that students can continue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm quite glad I'm not wearing the PUB hat now. So would you want to answer the first part of the question? <laughs> I think my boss just left the auditorium. <laughs> um, I'll add on to that, but <laughs> yeah, water quality does take money to, to, to assess. And as part of the ecological work, we realize that as well. It's not cheap. That's why some of this data is not available freely, unfortunately. Um, Publication-wise, uh, student reports and NUS, things like that, we, we currently don't have uh, a portal for that. Okay, but past reports are available in Science Library. Uh, if you approach the respective supervisors, some of them do hand it out. Um, we do pass respective reports to, let's say, the na national agencies like PUB or NPARCS. Um, as to what's available freely out there, I don't think that's that much avenue at the moment. Unless you approach the respective uh, lecturer or supervisor. Let me try to um, answer your question. So it's not easy to get information from PUB. I would agree with that. It's definitely not available online um, and publicized. But what you could do is that um, we do give our information to research partners. So if there is a project that um, you are having your students involved in, and then you can write to PUB, and then we can um, do up some joint project, then the data will be shared to you. Th so that is avenue for that, but just that um, um, it will take time. Uh, it's some administrative procedure. So it's not to say that it's a closed door. Um, that's way to go around it, but um, it's definitely not readily available. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, let me just uh, add on a little bit. Uh, the project that uh, Junhee and I are currently working on, we are monitoring all the reservoirs in Singapore. Uh, one of the uh, deliverables for PUB is actually to come up with an uh, education tool right, that people actually use to, uh, well, it's still in process, but it's. Uh, it's still a bit ambitious at this stage, but we are trying to come out with you know, what are the invertebrates that are actually associated with different kind of conditions of water. And that we hope, in probably in five years' time, we can actually push it out to the public as well. But don't hold my word to it. <laughs> Alright, next. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Anand. Um, since the topic of uh, redeveloping Bishan Park, the Kalang River, from a river to a canal, now back to a river, uh, is brought up. So I thought I should mention, I live in Bishan, a few hundred meters from the park. So uh, uh, watching the de redevelopment interest, uh, and there's been you know, talking with friends, family who use the park also. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, pros and cons, whether it's a good thing to do, bad thing to do. Okay, be that as it may. Uh, but also about coming back to the issue of pollution. Uh, and we also talk a lot about coastal cleanup and, and all that. Uh, I don't know whether everyone is, most people are aware here. Uh, one of the interesting things about this development is uh, a McDonald's has set up right there in Bishan Park, in the park itself, uh, barely like 30, 40 meters from the redeveloped Kalang River. Yeah, uh, and it's a prime spot. I've actually been there a few times. It's quite nice. You sit there, you watch the sunset, you know, over the park. The river is all not still open. Uh, I mean, the the the. the uh, access to the uh, Kalang River is, is closed up at the moment. Uh, but I'm just wondering, since the people from NPARCS and all here, is there any effort to work with this McDonald's uh, to mitigate the rubbish that's going to come out from there? Because I'm already seeing signs, uh, uh, not in the river yet, but the walkway into McDonald's, there's rubbish all over now. 
people are already starting to throw, uh, and it's a natural thing, people are walking by and they're already throwing rubbish along the pathway and everything. And here we are talking about a uh, river which is part of our water system. Yeah, it's not like a McDonald's which is like the one in Angmokyo, in the park itself, but it's a normal park. It's not part connected to our water system. This part of our water system, and I foresee it's going to be a problem. Okay, I, I, I foresee there's a condo that's coming up right behind with a few hundred people. It's going to be opening, will be open by the end of the year. A lot more people are going to use the place. So, uh, is there anything, any plans for that? Or if there isn't, something should be done. Thank really. you. Yeah, because it's going to affect, you talk about removing all the heavy metals and the, and the plants and everything. This will be another issue that will come up. So, uh, some, some kind of initiative, I think, should be done uh, with these guys. Sure. Yeah. Anyone from a park development in M Park? I'm actually not aware that there is actually a McDonald's in the, in the, in the <laughs> park. <laughs> there you go. No, if you want to do a coastal cleanup of Bishan Park, uh, it might happen. Uh, in Salam River. Uh, this goes on. Uh, I think I'd like to say something. Okay. Um, well, number of us are not from parks, we can't answer for them, but we take note of your, your feedback. We will actually tell them that there's potential issue with pollution and we will look into the issue. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, I'm no longer with PUB, so I can't really answer this, but uh, I'm sorry I have to arrow it because someone in the crowd actually has some answers that you may want to listen to. and we are looking at talking with McDonald's to address that issue, the details of which I will not divulge um, to protect our partner's um, confidentiality, but I can talk to you later. Yeah, and and um, <laughs> um, I think there's a volunteer group that's being talked about, so if you're interested in joining it as a resident of Bishan, um, I'd like to get your details. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Grace. I think the, the situation is not whether there's a McDonald's or any other thing. If it's Bishan Park, it's actually the people from Singapore. If it's an international coastal cleanup, we still have the water bringing in the rubbish, correct? So I think the whole idea and the whole problem is actually the people. And it's our young people that we really have to reach. I mean, wherever you may have all the plans for possible. So like, that's why, I mean, um, we are educators, especially all the educators here. Really, it is really reaching out our people and making a difference. So it's, it's not just a partnership, but, yeah. So. Uh, thanks, thanks for the last comment. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, the, the whole idea of this ABC is actually equivalent to water sensitive urban design uh, program which is uh, in, uh, in implemented in Australia. So the whole, whole program is actually trying to uh, open up this uh, water system so that it, it becomes visible to public and they begin to take responsibly, uh, responsible for that rather than throwing rubbish into the waterways and, and this uh, drain because for the past many years engineers CV engineer says that it is best to discharge water as fast as possible uh, to, uh, to the sea. So the best way to do is with concrete canal and most of the drains are covered up. So if it is covered up, it's out of sight, uh, up, it's out of mind. So you have no idea what is actually in the water. So once it is opened up, then you know. Okay, I think we have time only for... Oh, you have a question. Okay, two last questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, uh, yeah. Same point, same point. Oh, same point. Uh, same point. <laughs> this, this kind of relates to what I mentioned earlier about uh, the segments of the community that are missing from here. Uh, the rubbish problem at Pishan Park is an isolated, not, not say isolated, but a limited effect because the McDonald's is there. True. But the fact is, uh, Singaporeans have gotten lazy. Right? Um, the main contributor of rubbish, say if you take a dustbin from any bus stop, is cigarette butts. And where are the cigarette butts? 
they are three steps away from the rubbish bin. Right? Um, as I think Ria said, if you like something, you should tell people that you like it this way and don't change it. But if you're such a great complainer, if you see someone throwing a cigarette butt on the floor, you should tell him as well. Of course, you might get punched in the face, but <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that is how uh, someone mentioned something about uh, ethics, right? This is how ethics is built up. This is how your culture is built up. Do you want to see a culture in Singapore when you're 70 where people just throw rubbish on the floor? I see this everywhere, not just in Bishan Park, although I guess with the McDonald's there, the situation is elevated. Um, and I don't know if uh, biodiversity, hard science is something that can actually deal with this issue because this is a behavioral change issue. It's a humanities issue. Someone mentioned something about how biodiversity now is being taught in humanities. But where are the humanities studies people here? Right? Do they even know that this is an important issue? Uh, you know, does MOE, the people who develop the curriculum, do they know that biodiversity is of such interest to Singaporeans that they should reintroduce it into the curricula? Um, I have no answers to this. I'm just questioning if there is effort in this area and perhaps it's time that we use this kind of symposia to actually connect. Not necessarily connect back to nature, but connect back to the people we want to bring to nature. Uh, because you have educators, you have the, you know, the people who have the money, you have uh, you know, uh, the humanities studies people and so on, which we need to bring into this forum. Thanks. All right, the uh, last question from... Okay, uh, hi, my name is Ivan. This is a question for uh, Yok Wee. Are you aware of any... Um, sorry. Are you aware of any um, plans or regulations in terms of the ornamental fish industry? Let's say some of the larger and supposedly more dangerous freshwater fishes. Because uh, besides piranhas, which I think are still banned in Singapore, although they have been caught previously before they were banned, uh, think things like, let's say, some of the larger catfishes, um, Arapaima, which I think are already in our waters, alligator guy as well, maybe even things like electric eel, electric catfish, all you need is some, some, some poor bugger falling into the water and getting zapped by electric eel that's in a reservoir, you know. Okay, interesting question. Um, the, actually, a better authority to answer that is AVA themselves, but from what I've heard, uh, AVA actually wanted to ban what they call so called monster fishes. They actually held a meeting with uh, some of the trade people, but I think I'm not sure what's the conclusion like. But apparently, they they were not very perceptive of whatever's in the trade and the stakeholders. They just wanted to get on with it because of certain issues. But one of the issues you bring out is, per is pertinent. That is uh, elements which are harmful of and have have recorded history of uh, being of certain harm to humans. Okay, of which uh, you mentioned electric uh, catfish or electric eel, piranhas. Okay, that's one that's been banned since the I think 80s. Um, a more pertinent issue that Darren brought up: freshwater stingrays. Okay, there have been cases, fatal cases of freshwater stingrays stinging people. Okay, of course there's the famous uh, Steve Irwin who got killed by a stingray as well. Very unfortunate, but. At the moment, no, no, no such regulations. Okay. Um, as you can see, um, a lot of the regulations are very dictated by the trade. Okay. And the ornamental fish trade is a multi-million dollar industry in Singapore. Okay. It brings in, as of I, what I know, is about, I think mid-2000s, it brings in about $70 million, if not more. Okay. So how are you to go against that? Okay. Well, the only way that I can see around it is through education. You reach out to the young kids, teach them properly what not to do and what to do. So that's, that's one avenue, but it's slow. But there will be results. Okay, Okay. Uh, then to add on to that, because um, besides fishes, there's also other things that are definitely illegal, like snapping turtles. They have been recorded in some of our waterways, and those are definitely not 
legally sold in Singapore. So I'm not sure whether AVA is doing something to cover uh, to, uh, to to cover the area. No, um, AVA is not doing anything about it. <laughs> Um, this this is an issue that has come up many times um, about legalizing other species for the pet trade. There, it's it's a very sticky issue, and it's it's something that we have to bring up time again and to discuss it more seriously with AVA. Um, maybe it's maybe now is the time. Okay, but the 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 thing is, we have to try. Uh, we have talked to them at certain times, but it's always governed by dollars. Okay. Um, if you legalize the pet trade to open up to all the so-called available animals that are in the trade, means turtles, snakes, tarantulas, it would be great. You know, the, the farms, the people bringing in uh, the pet trade will bloom. But what are the repercussions? That we have to think carefully before we actually fully open such things. So that's what AVA is afraid of, opening up the Pandora's box, I guess. Because a lot of these animals that are in the trade are what we call tropical animals. And if they do get loose in our, in, uh, in our little bits of fragile ecosystems that we have, it might spell trouble for whatever's left inside there. So if you want to go forth to that, we have to take into consideration the repercussions. Oh, sorry, just... Yeah, okay, maybe um, this is one thing to add. Um, one thing is, um, uh, I don't know if anyone was even thinking this or not, but um, some may have the impression that all aliens are bad. I, I work on invasion biology nowadays, and um, I'm nowadays, yeah. So I'm trying, but I'm trying not to take a very xenophobic uh, um, stance towards it. Uh, they're simply non-native species. Whether they're doing anything wrong or not here, we, as scientists, we can't really say until we really find out, until we test, until we do some studies. So, um, and then, for example, in the reservoirs, um, it's been said by several speakers today, the reservoirs are not natural systems. Um, if I were to go in there and wave a magic wand, which I don't have, but if I was to wave a magic wand and all the non-native species disappear like that, uh, um, our... Harlequin reservoirs are not going to swim out into a reservoir today because the reservoir has a totally different uh, environment from the forest streams and the swamps. Okay? So, like it or not, there are, many of them are here, they are established, they are here to stay and they have a niche in this artificial system that we have. So, we, um, to some degree, we have to get used to it. Um, it's sort of adaptation on our part, uh, societal adaptation. And environmentally also, our, um, our, even our native species are, are making use of this. Um, because some of them are providing, some of these non-native species are providing food for, for native species. Right? Uh, I think um, Ding Li has, a, has some students doing some work. We were talking about it. And uh, some of the threatened birds of prey are actually having uh, a good time feeding on tilapias and, <laughs> and all this. Lah. So, imported food. All right? So anyway, main thing is when you talk about alien species, try to keep a, a fairly neutral, open mind. You know, don't be too xenophobic, don't be too, uh, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, kind of thing. Lah. All right? So not all non-native species are terribly bad. That's it. Thanks. Okay, I think I'm going to close the session and thank the speakers. Um, Okay, so we're having one more tea break for one hour, so you can go outside, mingle, ask them more questions. 50 minutes, sorry, five zero minutes. Right. So come back at four. Five, six, 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 six,